uh, the epiphenomena argument for symmetry to reality inference. So this is kind of one of the central arguments that I'm making in um, my in progress uh, book length project on symmetry to reality inference. Um, uh, so I'm excited to share it with you all. Now, um, I'm going to start with kind of a rough gesture at the formal properties of the stuff I'm going to be talking about. Um, as I mean, especially as anyone who has read uh, Bellet's paper on symmetry and equivalence will know, there are a bunch of ways to fill in the details of the sketch that I'm going to point to here. And I'm not going to kind of like commit myself in this talk to a particular way of filling in those details. But, um, you know, I'm just, I'm the, the assumption I'm going to make is that there is going to be a satisfactory way to fill in those details and that it may be uh, in certain ways kind of um, dependent on which theoretical framework we're working in so that different frameworks will require different precise definitions of asymmetry. But here's the kind of general features that I'm going to take such a definition to have. Um, so asymmetry, as I'm using the term, a dynamical symmetry is going to be a transformation from possible states of a theory to other possible states of the theory, right? It's going to have the further property that it takes dynamically possible histories to other dynamically possible histories, which is the same as saying that it commutes with the dynamical laws. That is to say, if I take a state, I transform it using a symmetry, um, and then I run the dynamical laws, I kind of get the same result that I would if I first ran the dynamical laws for the same period of time and then uh, implemented the symmetry transformation. Um, you know, there's a complication with how do you uh, apply this criterion in the case of um, time-dependent symmetries like boosts or time reversal. Uh, there's a nice discussion of this in David Wallace's paper um, on symmetry. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to kind of, again, set aside those niceties for, for our purposes. Um, another assumption I'm going to make is that symmetries act smoothly, um, you know, continuously and differentiably on the theories, uh, you know, what we ordinarily think of as the theories um, independent and dependent variables and its state space, right? Um, that's going to be an assumption that, as we'll see, is kind of important to getting any mileage out of the stuff that I'm going to say. Um, and so at the end of the talk, assuming I have enough time, I will refute an objection by Shamik Dasgupta to this smoothness assumption that I'm making. So what's symmetry to reality inference, right? Well, Dasgupta coined the term uh, for a thing that we've been doing for some time. Um, I would trace it at least to, uh, you know, like, well, I mean, you know, Leibniz is kind of doing it right. But um, I would trace the kind of contemporary version of it to uh, Vile's book on symmetry, where he he talks pretty explicitly about um, the special relativistic revolution taking this form, right? Um, so, uh, just a sec. Um, sorry, I think I was doing something that was slowing me down. Uh, I think I'm fine now. Okay, so um, here's the, the way the inference goes. If I have a quantity Q that's not invariant under some symmetry of my theory, T, right? Um, I, I, I start out with the observation that Q is not invariant under the symmetry. That is, it changes when I apply the symmetry. Then uh, the symmetry reality inference pattern goes, well, that gives us a strong reason to prefer an interpretation of that theory according to which that quantity, that non-invariant quantity, uh, is not robustly real, right? Um, so, you know, uh, Vile uses the term, you know, objectivity is invariance under the group of automorphisms of the theory, you know, the, the symmetries. Um, I'm taking that to mean something like, well, when I say objectivity, I mean, what's really real, right? And, uh, you know, nicely, We've already seen some some uh, some of Jill's thoughts uh, that they're kind of related to this, right? Uh, I take real real realness, um, robust realness, as I call it, to be something basically like Jill's notion of structure, right? What is uh, which parts of the theory are a better match 
for the way that reality is in itself versus which parts of the theory might be conveying accurate facts in a certain sense, but are a poor match for the way that reality is in itself, right? So, um, but, you know, you, you can fill it in with whatever your preferred notion is of something's being physically significant or highly fundamental according to a theory. And I, I, I don't think that's a distinction that anyone can really do without in our business. Um, you know, I, I'd be willing to, to explain why I think that is, but I think it's fairly obvious. Um, a thing to note about symmetry or reality inference is that it's a norm for starting with uh, a partial interpretation, right? That is a theory where you know some things about what the theory is saying about reality and um, coming to a conclusion about what a more complete interpretation of that theory or perhaps a, a fully complete interpretation of that theory ought to be. That is, you know, a, a more complete story about what that theory is telling you about reality. Um, you you need some ingredients in order to do symmetry to reality inference. You need to... Uh, um, well, you need enough ingredients basically to apply a dynamical definition of what you know symmetries you're talking about. So you need enough, at least, um, definitions of what's going on in the theory to describe the theory's dynamical laws at a certain, you know, uh, in a certain broad way, at least. So this isn't going to get you from a completely uninterpreted theory to an interpretation of a theory, but it will allow you to take a partial interpretation of a theory and end up with a better interpretation of it. So here's my goal for this talk. Um, one thing we have already plenty of uh, is kind of parsimony-based arguments for symmetry reality inference, right? Arguments that say, well, you know, quantities that aren't invariant under symmetries, uh, they're not detectable, they are surplus structure, um, Occam's razor, in some sense, tells us to do without surplus structure. So uh, uh, let's do without those quantities that fail to be invariant. I like those arguments just fine. You know, I, I totally buy them. But I think there's a, a further argument that you can make, which is uh, different in a way. Um, so the, the, the older parsimony-based argument says, um, here's a theoretical virtue, Occam's razor, that non-invariant quantities do badly according to that virtue. I'm going to try to point out, well, here's another theoretical virtue that non-invariant quantities do badly according to, right? Um, that is, I'm going to argue that quantities that aren't invariant have some pathological properties, and hence we have kind of extra reason to reject them even over and above the parsimony or alchemist-based uh, reasons that we have to reject them already. So here's the kind of starting point for why I think um, the non-invariant quantities have a pathological feature. They are, as I'm going to say, epiphenomenal, right? That is to say, um, what, what do I mean by epiphenomenal? I mean, they kind of, um, they live in their own separate shadow world is kind of like a, 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 an evocative way to put it, right? They notice, uh, the, 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 the non-invariant quantities kind of notice themselves um, and they also notice the invariant quantities, but the invariant quantities kind of don't notice what's going on with the non-invariant quantities, right? So the non-invariant quantities are kind of like this, like, um, this extra shadow that's cast by the universe of the invariant quantities and doesn't really do anything back to the invariant quantities. And, um, I'm going to say that's a pathological feature that they have. So here's the kind of example that I think is relevant to motivate this. Um, the non-invariant quantities can't be reliably correlated with invariant quantities. And John Roberts, in, in a, a really cool paper about symmetry um, from BJPS, uh, shows how this can be used to kind of establish the, the, the common um, uh, proverb that quantities that aren't invariant under symmetries are not measurable, right? So the kind of example he's thinking of is the following. Well, suppose that I take my prized possession uh, and it has some some absolute velocity. And I think I've got some kind of absolute velocity detector, right? So I hook my prized possession up to the absolute velocity detector and the little like digital readout on the, the absolute velocity detector um, reads out some number. Uh, I think it's saying that it's going like 60 miles an hour uh, at absolute velocity. Well, um, that readout 
of course, is a readout in terms of invariant quantities, right? Uh, the display shows you the kind of relative positions of the um, the little LCD uh, things on the readout screen. And now those don't change when I apply a Galilean boost to the entire system of my prize possession and the detector. So as a result, right, the detector's output number, an invariant um, uh, uh, fact, right, in terms of the kind of relative positions of the LCD uh, blips, that's going to be left unchanged by that Galilean boost, but the absolute velocity of my prize possession is not going to be left unchanged, okay? So, of course, this example shows that uh, quantities that aren't invariant are not measurable. What it also shows is that you can't set up your non-invariant quantities in a way so that the invariant quantities kind of care what their values are, right? Uh, there's no way to um, set up a kind of counterfactual dependence or a kind of like um, dynamical dependence of the invariant quantities on the non-invariant quantities, because you're just going to be able to present another argument like Roberts's argument for whatever symmetry it is that you are talking about, uh, that these quantities fail to be invariant under. And so they can't be um, reliably correlated via the dynamical laws with the invariant quantities. There's also a nice discussion of this in, in you know, again, uh, Wallace's very rich recent paper uh, where he goes into a nice formal account of this. Okay, so now um, I want to draw a parallel between this epiphenomenal trait of the non-invariant quantities in a theory with symmetries and qualia in an epiphenomenal dualist picture of the mind, right? Because um, there's something that these two things have in common. Think of the dualist qualia. So, so think of some, some view on which, um, well, when you see a red object, there's all the physical stuff that happens. And then additionally, via some psychophysical law that connects your brain with uh, the immaterial or you know, dualist properties that um, represent consciousness. Um, you also end up experiencing red qualia, right? But those red qualia don't have any physical effect on the stuff that's going on in your brain, kind of by assumption, right? The, the view is they're epiphenomenal, okay? So you again, you have this kind of shadow world of the qualia, right? They're, they are um, acted upon by the physical stuff. You know, you, you, you point yourself at the apple and red qualia will show up as a result of those physical things happening, but nothing physical is going to happen as a result of the red qualia showing up, okay? So the physical properties all go about their business as if the dualist epiphenomenal qualia did not exist, but the physical properties affect the dualist qualia, right? Because, you know, what you're looking at is going to be, um, you know, dynamically related to which qualia you are experiencing. In the same way, right? Uh, the quantities that fail to be invariant under a symmetry are dynamically isolated from the invariant quantities, right? The invariant quantities kind of go about their business. So, you know, the, the display number on the quote unquote absolute velocity meter, um, uh, it goes about its business without actually noticing what absolute velocity my prized possession has. Um, and there's no way to kind of create a nomologically reliable correlation between that number on the display and the absolute velocity of the object. So there's a kind of dynamical isolation, one-way dynamical isolation between uh, the invariant quantities and the non-invariant quantities. Now the view, right? So here's my new-ish at least argument for symmetry to reality inference. Um, again, one thing you're gonna think is, well, Occam's razor, you can get rid of these extra epiphenomenal properties. And that's true, right? You can get rid of them uh, without empirical cost to the theory. So that's a good thing, getting rid of kind of excess stuff. Um, the other further thing I want to say is that it's actively a vice to posit epiphenomenal properties that are um, dynamically isolated from the rest of what's going on in the universe in this way. 
And I think that the the example of dualist qualia kind of illustrates why this is, right? Now, epiphenomenalism about the mind, I'm not I'm not hardcore enough to say it's obviously false, right? But the reason why I'm not that hardcore and I'm not willing to go so far on a limb as to say that there obviously aren't epiphenomenal qualia is just because the problem of consciousness is so hard to solve that you can kind of get yourself inside the frame of mind of saying, well, there's no way to solve it except by saying that there are these extra qualia properties that live in their own shadow world, right? Um, but clearly, if you could do without those shadow properties that you know are acted upon by the physical but don't act upon the physical themselves, you would have a better theory of the mind, right? Other things being equal, if you could do without those, those, uh, those epiphenomenal properties. I think clearly a theory is better, that is to say more plausible, if it doesn't posit any epiphenomenal stuff. And this goes above and beyond um, the betterness of a theory being parsimonious, right? It's not just that a parsimonious theory is better. A theory that doesn't have uh, these ineffectual epiphenomenal quantities is also better, right? Um, an analogy that I kind of make here is think about other traits that we think of as like physically pathological right like um like if you have a theory where um there's kind of like uh you know totally unmediated action at a distance instead in, in the, the, the sense of like transmitting energy without a field as a mediator um if you think of a theory where it fails to have a well-posed initial value problem so that you can't predict either probabilistically or deterministically the future from the past um, reality could be like that, right? Reality could have laws that meet those two criteria, but yet we tend to say it's a pathology of a theory if it has if its laws have those features, right? Um, what I take that to be an indication of is we're kind of um, uh, as theorists glomming onto some reasons to think that it's not plausible to suppose that reality has those features. And I also think it's implausible to suppose that reality has epiphenomenal features. Maybe it does, but we should assume that it doesn't unless we need to suppose that it has epiphenomenal features. So it's kind of implausible to start with that reality includes a parallel shadow world of epiphenomena. A thing to notice, um, is that actually in the dialogue about the, the interpretation of quantum mechanics, this issue has come up before, actually. Um, so here's a, an old objection to Bohmian mechanics by Abner Shimoni that has been also uh, posed by David Albert a few times, right? Um, think of the particles or the corpuscles in Bohmian mechanics. Those dynamically depend on the wave function via the guidance equation, but the Bohmian particles don't do anything back to the wave function, right? Um, you know, there's, there's, as Shimoni put it, um, there's action of the wave function on the particles without reaction of the particles on the wave function. I mean, I think it's telling about this example, actually, that the Bohmians, uh, you know, Dura Goldstein, Zongi, and their co-authors, have responded to this um, this objection not by saying, look, we don't care about this. Um, instead, this is one of the reasons they cite as a motivation to interpret the wave function as a physical law rather than a concrete physical thing, that that gets rid of this problem about the particles being, um, in a sense, epiphenomenal, right? So... Um, even the proponents of the Boeing mechanics view realize that this is kind of a theoretical disadvantage or a prima facie pathology of their theory. Now, the reason why the Bohmians can, can pull this move, they can say, well, actually, only the, uh, the stuff that you think of as quote unquote epiphenomenal um, uh, are real concrete physical quantities and the wave function is itself a law. The reason that they can do that is that um, in Bohmian mechanics, the thought goes, the experimentally measurable data supervenes on the positions of the particles. And in particular, like the particles are measurable, right? 
So um, that allows them to get rid of the, uh, what, we, what we might say, the non-epiphenomenal uh, quantities instead of the epiphenomenal ones. But in the present case with symmetries, we have kind of the opposite situation. Only the invariant quantities, um, the ones that don't live in the shadow world, right? Only those ones are measurable. And the ones that are epiphenomenal, the quantities that fail to be invariant, you know, the variant quantities, you, you might say, um, those ones fail to be measurable. So I think we should kind of pull the opposite move that the Bohmians do in the case of a theory with symmetries and get rid of the uh, the um, the epiphenomenal quantities. To kind of uh, sum up the argument in... in um, in uh, you know, uh, like meme form, right? Uh, you, you can kind of break down the properties that a theory with symmetries is talking about into two classes. So there are the variant ones, right? And the invariant ones. So the invariant ones, um, the invariant ones, some of them are measurable, right? Um, some of them are essential to the recording of past measurement results. And so it looks like you would be making a big mistake if you developed an interpretation of the theory that did without those quantities. On the other hand, there are the variant properties, you know, on the left side of this, this diagram. And um, well, none of those are measurable, you know, that, that follows from the argument that Roberts made. Um, they dynamically depend on the invariant properties, but they don't dynamically influence the invariant properties themselves. So they are both um, surplus, in the in the Occamist sense, but they also, I would say, have a pathology in the sense that they don't have any dynamical influence on the whole rest of the world, right? So uh, those properties we ought to do without in our interpretation of the theory. Now, I said before that I was going to defend this smoothness assumption that we make when we do symmetry to reality inference. Um, without this assumption, you kind of can't get anything um, because the definition of a symmetry becomes so, uh, you know, potentially um, anything goes, right? Because you could have a symmetry that just interchanges two states, you know, like let's say it just interchanges, you know, the vacuum state and the three particle state or something and nothing else. Um, if you didn't require the symmetry to be continuous in terms of the basic variables, and then you'd have way too many symmetries and, and symmetry reality inference would be obviously wrong. So um, Das Gupta, though, is very down on the idea that the smoothest requirement can be an assumption that we make at the start of the process of symmetry to reality inference. I'm gonna need to show that that's not true, right? Because I think we do uh, need to make that assumption from the start of the process of symmetry to reality inference. Well, here is Das Gupta's objection to doing that. He says, look, suppose for example, that you have some classical mechanical theory and you require your symmetries to be continuous as transformations on state space or continuous in terms of uh, the position variable, for example, right? He says, well, a definition like that is objectionably arbitrary because you're picking some physical features, right? You're picking uh, the geometry of the state space or you are picking um, the position variable. And you're saying, um, well, it's going to follow by the definition of symmetry that you can't run a symmetry to reality inference to get rid of that quantity that you're treating as privileged, right? Because you're requiring the symmetries to be continuous in that quantity. So you kind of have to assume that it's real in your process of symmetry to reality inference. Um, I mean, what you're doing effectively is taking the differential structure of the theory and saying that is objective structure uh, before I allow myself to engage in symmetry to reality inference at all. And Das Gupta says, well, look, what's so special about the differential structure of a theory or anything else you could come up with? Um, why are they by definition immune to being rejected as unreal on the basis of the symmetry to reality inference, right? And, and Das Gupta's idea goes, well, there's no principled um, way to pick out those quantities as the special ones that you shouldn't be able to get rid of when you apply symmetry to reality inference. And indeed, right, he, he goes on to say in another part of this paper, well, we would have said 
prior to Einstein that things like absolute simultaneity were uh, part of the privileged structure that symmetries need to respect. Um, but of course, that turned out to be false, right? And it turned out that we got rid of some of those features with symmetry reality inference. Well, I think that Das Gupta is um, being a little bit idealistic here, a little bit too idealistic. So um, by way of defending these smoothness requirements, I'd first like to point out, right, um, symmetry reality inference, as I said at the start of this talk, has to begin with a partial interpretation of the theory that we are working on, right? I can't give you a theory, for example, and tell you, oh, um, I'm not telling you which variables in this theory represent time, right? And then, you know, expect you to be able to look at the theory and figure out what are the dynamical symmetries of the theory, right? That's not, <laughs> that's not possible because like, Dynamical symmetry involves time as a kind of input to it, okay? So there's there's some amount of interpretation that needs to be done on the theory to begin with, right? Um, and so one of the assumptions like that that we need to make in order to engage in symmetry to reality inference is uh, to assume that metrical properties of our basic variables uh, have some physical significance. If we had dynamical symmetries that were discontinuous in those basic variables in the way that Dasgupta is entertaining, um, then the, the partial interpretation, the starting partial interpretation of the theory would treat states as arbitrarily, you know, that are arbitrarily similar in these metrics as being qualitatively different, like totally different, okay? And what that would mean is our starting partial interpretation is all wrong. Right, the theory is not in good shape to apply symmetry reality inference. We need to go back to the drawing board and develop a new starting partial interpretation before we can even begin symmetry to reality inference. Right, so it's kind of like if you're going to do symmetry to reality inference at all, you need to begin with the assumption that you have at least a minimally satisfactory partial interpretation. Right, among other things, it might need to identify the time variables so that you can talk about dynamics. Another thing that we've seen that it needs to do is that it needs to have some definition of continuity for the, the basic variables so that you can apply a smoothness requirement. And, you know, it's too bad that we can't start with nothing and engage in symmetry to reality inference, but that's just not possible. And Dasgupta is trying to suppose that we can start with nothing. Well, we can't. So the nature of this man's mistake, I would say, is that he's lost track of the fact that symmetry real inference only makes sense at all once we already have an empirically adequate partial interpretation of the theory, right? If we don't have that to begin with, then the process can't get started in the first place. And so, um, you know, yeah, we need to make some assumptions in order to suppose that there's an empirically adequate partial interpretation of the theory, and there's no other way to go about this. So, the um, the complaint against a view like mine that I need to make some substantive assumptions about a starting partial interpretation. That's that's really what everybody would need to do if they want to engage in symmetry inference at all. All right. So that is what I have for you folks today. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. And uh, <clears throat> good that we have enough time to discuss uh, your talk. Uh, okay. So. Um... The Wallace will be the respondent. Hey, can anyone hear me? Uh, yes, uh, so thank you for being uh, here on time and uh, for agreeing to um, make a response besides a talk. So you have up to 10 minutes and then uh, David Becker will try to reply. Hey, my pleasure. So, so thanks to David for a very characteristically interesting, thought-provoking set of ideas, and also for the Transformer shout out for those of us who are geeks on the subject as, as, as children. Um, so I've got, um, I, get, I guess, four quick things um, broadly flow together. So the starting thought is um, coming off the Dasgupta smoothness concern, which I take, yeah, I take it links back to the initial shout out to Bellot. Um, and my concern here is that 
Absolutely. As, as you obviously recognise, we have to have some kind of constraint on what kind of transformations count as dynamical symmetries to which these arguments can be applied, because otherwise it, they trivialise. But the worry is, as you know, um, merely requiring kind of topological or differential topological notions like smoothness isn't anything like strong enough to deliver that to us. I mean, it's it's easy enough to construct are smooth but otherwise arbitrary bijections of the solution space and extend them smoothly but otherwise arbitrarily to everything else. It's easy enough to be in Hamiltonian dynamics and construct a arbitrary smooth um, um, yeah, canonical transformation of the data and then propagate it forward as a time dependent symmetry. And even if we don't want to play those kind of formal games, we have um, you know clear physically relevant examples like the the, the lens ringer symmetries um, of the two-body problem, where manifestly, um, on our normal interpretation of these theories, the symmetries are transforming um, uh, a leaving um, variant quantities that we want to take as physically significant. So in the lens in your case, for instance, the shape of the orbit is not invariant under the symmetry transformation, but if shape of orbits are not physical, then what is? Um, <clears throat> and I sort of, I mean, in some ways, this is prefacing things I'll say myself, but I, I, my, my, my diagnosis, what it's worth of what's going on there, is that there needs to be a more intimate connection here between which symmetries you want to take seriously and the actual idea you're using to tell us what we should read from symmetries when we do take them seriously, which is we really want to connect to the idea that symmetry transformations um, leave, um, uh, so, so, somehow have a dynamical separation, somehow it's un there's, a, there's a salient way in which it's unobservable, and that ought to be something we're getting at that we ought to be able to get at formally. But whether or not that's the right diagnosis, I think it's this, uh, there's a need in this kind of program to say something to trim down the dynamical symmetries that needs to be much stronger than, I, I think I think I totally agree with your position on description in its own terms, that seems totally reasonable, but you know, as, as, as I say, and as you know, mere smoothness is just, is, is just only the beginning of constraining that group. Okay, so that flows into the second, um, uh, the, the second issue I wanted to raise. I mean, the, uh, the the way you are describing the symmetry transformations is very much written around symmetry transformations of the universe um, or of closed systems isolated from others. Um, and I I, I want to hear the word subsystem here. I mean, partly I want to hear it because it's a shout out to Valeria's conference theme. But um, even independent of that, I want to hear it on kind of methodological grounds. So if I take the take, take the, the Galilean symmetries we were talking about earlier, I mean. Uh, we don't want to ask, or I, I claim we shouldn't want to ask, what would happen if we performed a Galilean symmetry transformation of the universe? Um, why shouldn't we be asking that? Well, A, because we can't do it as a practical matter. It's relatively straightforward to put Optimus Prime uh, in uniform motion relative to where Optimus Prime was previously. It's significantly more difficult to do that the universe. Um, but, I mean, it's not just a practical matter, if I can say just. Um, the universe probably doesn't have the Galilei symmetry group as part of its symmetries. It probably doesn't have any translation symmetry group as part of our symmetries. It probably has no global symmetries at all. Um, so it sort of feels to me as if in if the game is we want to understand, for instance, whether boost properties are a variant, we ought to be asking about boost properties of subsystems, you know, boost the Optimus Prime. Um, and uh, that's the framework I want to be thinking in terms of. I mean, there's an alternative route that says, look, I'm going to play with toy um, toy universes where these really are the exact symmetries, but I just get nervous about what we could infer there. I sort of would like to keep our symmetry inferences concerned to the actual symmetries we see, we see around us and the things we can get epistemic handles on. Um, and then that sort of links to the third thought, which is that, um, is it so clear that we we correctly want to say the variant properties are not real. I mean, maybe this turns on this issue of quite what what real in the most fundamental sense or something, which I'm kind of a little nervous about. But um, in in some order, ordinary sense, it seems that um, uh, yeah, the 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 velocity of a moving object is measurable. Um, it's something that where if, it's, if it was moving at different speed, the speedometer would show something different. So there's, a count, there's counterfactual dependence, for instance, on the the properties of um, the, on the absolute uh, you know, between, between the, the invariant the, the um, velocity property of my car and the invariant properties of the speedometer. It's true that to calibrate that, I need to um, just pick an arbitrary choice of velocity. But it's still true that if my car had been moving twenty meters per second less quickly in 
uh, as, a, as an absolute factor and all other facts were held, held fixed, then um, it, the speedometer would have shown a different kind of number. Um, it, it's also true that a lot of our descriptive machinery in lots of ordinary places seems to be used varying quantities. So we seem to, I mean, Enrique Gomez brought up the, the, the example of the metric in the chat a minute ago, and I think that's a nice example. Feels as if um, uh, we want to be able to talk about metrical features of certain subsystems. Um, and again, I can see how if one wants to move to the level of the universe, one starts thinking, well, I'll reduce all these things to relational properties, but then I worry a little bit again about how cosmological we're pushed to being. And, and I think part of this is perhaps that's a legit methodology, but maybe it shows that there's a substantial set of methodological questions as to what we're doing in your framework that um, it might be interesting to make explicit, it might be interesting to think whether we're thinking primarily of symmetries of the universe, and then if so, what's the methodology there and what's the what's the connection to... Um, uh to sort of you know, more down to earth bits of sort of physics data and the, the last observation i want to make is in a slightly different direction which is the the epiphenomenal phenomenal observable point and i think there's something really important here um and i i, I, I think a shout out to roberts is right i think roberts points something important out it's certainly something i've thought about um i want to wonder though whether it's really the case that we should think about the dialectic here as um the epiphenomenal phenomenal properties are disconnected from the observable properties. Um, uh, sorry, let, let me rephrase that. The epiphenomenal argument is disconnected from the observable argument. Because I kind of want to suggest that um, what makes us want to say that epiphenomenal properties shouldn't be in our theory is precisely that they are in principle unobservable properties. And we could have no reason to have them. Um, and, and conversely, the only grounds on which we'd ever have reason to say something is in principle unobservable is if it's provably epiphenomenal. I mean, what's the form of the argument um, that <clears throat> we actually can't observe symmetry variant properties or we can't record symmetry variant properties in symmetry invariant properties? And ultimately, it's it's about the fact that I have a, as you say yourself, a closed system dynamics for the, the invariant properties. And precisely because I have a closed system dynamics for the invariant properties, it's never going to be the case that differences in the variant properties can show up in the difference of the invariant properties. So, you know, the argument that some variables are epiphenomenal with respect to the rest of the variables uh, just seems to be the same argument as the argument that the, um, <coughs> the, um, those variables are unobservable with respect to those other variables. And so then if I ask, like, why, why don't we want epiphenomenal variables in theories, the, the kind of arguments one tends to come up with tend to be either if you like, they're directly epistemically unsatisfactory because um, we know we can observe the, the relevant variable, so it can't be epiphenomenal, or we don't feel quite so confident there, but we feel that the unobservability of something is a problem in its own terms. So if I think about the core philosophy of mind case, um, what's the argument against mental properties being epiphenomenal? I mean, the standard kind of arguments from, you know, philistine functionalists like me is, well, uh, don't mental properties seem to have causal properties? Um, doesn't your belief that I have mental states sometimes connect to the fact I'm telling you about it? Doesn't isn't there a link between my believing something and my asserting that I believe something? Isn't there some sense uh, in which uh, uh, my being in pain is connected to the fact that the neural signals passing through me? And if you can solve those problems, if you've got a, <laughs> which I think is utterly hopeless, but if you could solve those problems um, and somehow make sense of the fact that um i can we can somehow have have knowledge of mental states and have semantic content about mental states and so on despite the fact that there are no causal connections between mental states and the physical it, it's not obvious to me that there's a residual um argument against their phenomenality um, and similarly with the symmetry case if um you know the the epiphenomenality seems to establish unobservability but well, it seems to be so, so synonymous with unobservability uh why ever would we want unobservable things in our theories? Um, if one bites the bullet and totally unobservable things in the theories, it's just obvious to me there's a separate argument or route for epiphenomenal things to be to be doing what they want to do. And, and I think if you look even at the Bohm case, then the sort of physicist objections here tend to be very much along the lines of, well, the, the particles have nothing to do. They can't matter to anything observable. Um, and then as you say, Bohm, you say, no, you're completely misunderstanding the theory. Um, but certainly that seems to be the form of how you talk to physicists. These are just useless. They're not doing anything. You can't get at them. You can't measure them. You can't observe them. So I'd want to ask whether we should think about the epiphenomenality case as a new argument 
rather than a way of really sharpening and getting tight on what the old argument was. Okay, I think that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you, David. That's plenty. Um, yeah, uh, uh, lots of great stuff. So, uh, let, yeah, let me. Uh, I'm not going to be able to get to all of it. Um, I'll probably have to to um, not talk about the 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 first thing. Um, so, like, um, uh, let, let me let me talk about the last thing first because uh, that way I'll remember better. Um, <laughs> so, like, um, uh, yeah, I think I I I think it I I. I think they are separate concepts. Uh, I think they come apart in a number of examples, right? So like, I mean, you know, I, I would say the Bowman example is one, but I don't think that's the only one, right? So like, um, you know, like, uh, uh, for example, uh, you can have quantities that are like unobservable in a certain sense because they're like behind a horizon or something like that. And that's not a case of epiphenomenality. Um, you know, you can have, you can have quantities that are like unobservable because it's impossible in principle for measuring devices to kind of like be fine grained enough to notice them or something. And I, I wouldn't, I, I think you could have examples like that. Like, you know, for example, like, um, um, uh, uh, the, 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 you know, the, these kind of arguments that the, one sometimes sees made about like string theory, you know, speculatively, obviously about like, oh, we can't probe distances smaller than like the string characteristic length or something like that. Right. Um, I, it's not obvious to me that that will turn out to be properties that are epiphenomenal in my sense, even though they would turn out in that theory to be uh, in principle unmeasurable. So, so I, th I think the concepts do come apart. Um, uh, but like, Ultimately, um, I suppose the, the the question of their extension is actually a little bit. Uh, I mean, I don't think it's completely separate, but but there's uh, there's the further question of whether there's kind of like even if the the two properties are extensionally the same, is there a further reason from epiphenomenality over and above unobservability? Um, in a sense it's it's quite difficult to kind of like um argue about that question because it's a kind of bedrock question about um norms of theory choice i think in a way right it's like what so 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 what i was trying to do with the bohmian example and the um uh the qualia example was like pump people's intuitions and say hey you know like um uh maybe maybe you do kind of start out endorsing you you the listener start out endorsing a norm that says um epiphenomenal properties are not good properties to to posit other things being equal um if that intuition pumping is is failing in your case then like you know like uh, the, it, it's very difficult to know what, what else to say i have no um, trust but, in my own intuitions pumping my yeah intuition. uh well yeah I, right so like so like i mean um I I mean intuition pumping in a, in quite a broad sense in the sense that I'm I'm I I'm trying to um so like a thing that we sometimes do with examples in science is say look um people seem to have made an inference for the following reasons we think it was a good inference therefore you think inferences of this sort are justified right that's the sense in which I'm I'm intuition pumping here yeah. um uh, so so okay uh, so I think that's the kind of dialectic uh, of that case. Okay, so um, um, subsystems. Yes, I think this is, uh, you know, I think this is the crux of a lot of where you and I see things differently, where otherwise I think on this kind of issue, uh, you and I are pretty um, pretty close to each other in a lot of ways in our views. Um, so like... Uh, so, so one of the parts of the book that I haven't fully written yet is uh, is a long discussion of your views about subsystems versus total systems. Um, I think that's I think that is you know kind of central to a lot of the stuff that's going on here. Um, I'll just say a little bit about my approach. Mm. So, so uh, the 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 way that I see what we're doing when we um, and, and this connects with with the stuff that you were talking about as well about uh, the real universe probably in a, in the precise sense lacking um, uh, rigid symmetries, for example, right? Um, so 
I think that what we're doing a lot of the time when, so, so uh, as you point out yourself many times, what we're doing whenever we interpret physics these days, as opposed to like in a hundred or 500 years or something is we're interpreting a theory that's not uh, perfectly fundamental and isn't yet finished in a certain sense. Right. Um, so uh, the, the, the way that I tend to see that process is um, as kind of, as kind of a process and steps where you, you say, well, what would things be like? Like if the theory were exactly true, now what sort of approximation relation can we see as existing between the theory and reality? And um, on the basis of that, what conclusions do we draw about the reality we inhabit on the basis of the theory that we're interpreting? So, um, so the way that I would tend to see things is, well, you know, like I start out with a theory uh, maybe that has a global symmetry. Um, I... I conclude that were that theory exactly true, then reality would be completely invariant under that global symmetry. Mm -hmm. And I proceed then to draw some conclusions about um, what reality is approximately like in the sense that like, you know, uh, of course, all of this is going to be um, necessarily fuzzy because we don't have the deeper, fully deep underlying theory mm -hmm. But um, we we come up with some justified conjectures about the sense in which it might be a good approximation to the truth to say that um, uh, that the non-invariant traits of the theory are not real. And I, I guess the form that that would take to me is um, so like at different scales or different degrees of approximation, uh, we can talk about which quantities are um, approximately fundamental at that scale, right? So like uh, in the domain of, you know, large N, right? There's a sense in which temperature is kind of close to uh, fundamental or is as robustly real as any of the quantities that we're talking about in thermodynamics. So in that sense, an interpretation of thermodynamics has to be based on temperature as one of the basic quantities. Similarly, I would say an interpretation of you know, Newtonian physics should be based on relative position as one of the basic quantities and not on absolute position as one of the basic quantities. And then we've got all kinds of questions to ask about, like, um, what's the connection between that and our world? Uh, uh, you know, I think there are, I think there are a lot of parallels there, but that's, that's kind of the way that I would tend to proceed, um, by kind of like holding on to some of these idealizations while we are interpreting the approximately true theory. And then, um, at the, at the stage of saying, what's the approximation relation between the approximately true theory and our reality? That's when I bring in, yeah, that's when I, I, I tend to want to say, uh, now you kind of put forward your caveats about the approximately true theory being wrong, uh, basically speaking. Um, and I think that kind of fits pretty well with what the practice, um, uh, of science kind of looks like when it comes to these things. Um, so, uh, uh, about, about the fact that we use a lot of variant properties and, you know, relational properties versus invariant ones and the kind of thing that, that, that Gomez brings up in the comments. I mean, I think, I think this is one of the tough things. Uh, and so, so keep in mind, um, symmetry to reality inference here that this, I, Das Gupta and I share this, uh, this view, it's not supposed to be a 100% knockdown reason to interpret a theory as being invariant. It's supposed to be a strong pro tanto reason to interpret a, a you know, the, 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 the invariant quantities as real. And that might be counteracted in some situations by the conclusion that you can't come up with a good interpretation of the theory on which the only real stuff is the invariant stuff. And then you might retreat to a view on which oh, like I allow some covariant quantities in as well or something which are kind of as invariant as we can get. In the case of GR, I mean, like there's, there's of course a long running debate about to what extent does the sophistication approach, you know, which has kind of come back into um, the dialogue with, with Neil Dewar's work, uh, to what extent does that approach allow us to view something like the metric as in a sense, totally invariant under the diffeomorphism symmetry of the theory? Because, you know, if you say that the points don't have hexaides, um, mm -hmm. There's a sense in which you can talk about the metric as being something that's left unchanged 
by the symmetries if if you apply to it that metaphysical interpretation, right? So um, so that would be the kind of direction that I would I would want to attempt to take things. And then if that failed, then I would retreat to the idea that, well, you know, um, symmetry reality uh, inference just provides pro tanto reasons to interpret a theory this way. Um, uh, you might need an interpretation that involves variant quantities, but if so, you should do so only grudgingly, right? And to the minimum degree necessary in order to make the theory work. So I guess that's that's kind of the, the useful stuff that, that perhaps I have to say right now in response. Okay, <clears throat> if uh, you are satisfied enough, uh, then we will uh, pass to uh, questions by other persons, if there are any. Uh, yeah, uh, anyone else? Uh, I mean, I will at this time, but others who should have a chance first. It looks like Jacob has a question. Uh, yeah, but uh, he is not uh, just that was a conflict. Uh, John to get to. Um, yeah, thanks, Dave. This was um, really, really cool. I have a question about one of the things that you said near the beginning about the, the really real um, thing. And then, so I was wondering, I mean, you know, um, some empiricists seem also interested in something like the symmetry to reality inference, right? I'm thinking of Ben Crossan, and I'm thinking of some of the things, I mean, the paper with Ismail, and then some of the papers Ismail has on our own also sort of suggest these things. And some, obviously, or maybe not obviously, it seems to me anyway that they can't be interested in the symmetry to reality inference because they're not real about, the, about it anyway. Um, and so do you think that it's just like misguided? Is this one of the things you think we need this notion of really real reality for? Or do you think there's just sort of two separate things going on that should be treated differently? Yeah, I mean that that paper I I is is difficult to interpret in a number of ways, um, and I, I I can I can send you my my discussion of it that I've written up uh, for for more uh, details on it. But like, um, but I mean one of the things that's kind of going on there, of course, is that von Frossen has his own definition of what it is to interpret a theory and what makes an interpretation interesting, which is quite different, I would say, from the definition that that, that David Wallace and I share in common. Um, so what, what, what David and I are more concerned with is how do we take a theory um, and draw conclusions from it about this world that we inhabit? Um, von Frossen, when he's interpreting a theory, is asking, how could that theory be possibly true? Right. What would, um, you know, so like I, Von Frossen, you know, uh, boss would say, you know, I, boss, do not believe uh, that this theory is describing reality accurately. But if I did believe that, what would I be believing? Right. Um, that's the kind of thing that he's asking about. So in that sense, right, um, uh, when he's interpreting a theory, Von Frossen, the empiricist, takes on a sort of hypothetical realism, right? Um, uh, which, which I think would be kind of compatible with uh, uh, the, the type of assumption that I'm making there. Um, you know, von Frossen is, is, is a quirky figure in a lot of ways, and I think this is one of them. And that makes it kind of, uh, you know, difficult to, to, to keep an eye on where all the pieces of his system fit together. But, but when he's talking about interpreting a theory, which he doesn't always treat as a useful process, but when he does treat it as a useful process, he's thinking of it as a hypothetical uh, activity in which he, in a sense, um, takes on the guise of the realist for present purposes, right? Okay, yeah, thanks. And I, yeah, I would like to, I'll email you about it, but I'd like to- be Great, you great, uh, awesome, John. Uh, John Arcee. Hi. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Um, I was just wondering, um, uh, so you say that a theory is better to the extent that it doesn't posit epiphenomenal stuff. That's a kind of theoretical virtue. And I was just wondering why that isn't a version of the parsimony argument or parsimony considerations. Um, you say that epiphenomena are surplus plus they have this uh, pathology, they don't have a dynamical influence on the rest of the world. But that just feels like a way of saying the way in which uh, it would be less parsimonious to posit them. You know, they're not needed to account for the rest of the world. 
Um, and it felt to me different in kind from the other sorts of pathologies that you mentioned, which I didn't write down. I forget what they are. Apologies. Um, so I just wanted to hear more about why this is sort of a new kind of uh, argument for the symmetry to reality inference and not sort of a version of parsimony considerations. Yeah, I mean, so one of the so 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 one of the kind of other pathologies that I mentioned was kind of like um, like discontinuous action at a distance, right? Um, so I, I think that one is kind of instructively similar to the epiphenomena one actually because they're both um they're both assumptions that we think are plausible about what kind of um like uh what ways it is reasonable to suppose that some parts of the world influence other parts of the world right um and they're defeasible Right. Like they're not, you know, we, we don't, our brains don't break down. We imagine a universe uh, with action at a distance is not mediated by fields or when we imagine a universe with epiphenomenal stuff. Um, but like, you know, we, we just, uh, um, it, it seems implausible, right? It seems like, seems like kind of a goofy conspiracy theory way for the universe to be set up. Um is that just the same as parsimony? Um, yeah, I mean, this kind of gets to the uh, this kind of gets to the exchange uh, at the at the at the outset of my response to David's comments, right? Um, it's it's really a question about yeah, if you imagine um, a you know if you imagine a quantity that you can do without, but that isn't epiphenomenal, does that seem, um, you know, like, uh, uh, like less of, uh, a good quantity to get rid of than one that, that is epiphenomenal. Right. And I think it, it does to me. Um, and I think that like, I mean, I think that like the, again, I think the Bomi mechanics example is a nice illustration of this, right? Because there we have, um, a theory that exhibits epiphenomenalism in my sense. Um, and it's quite difficult to get rid of the epiphenomenalism because you can't just get rid of the quote unquote epiphenomenal quantities um, because they're the particle positions. And yet the Bohmians were like, okay, we got to do what we can to make it so that our universe doesn't have these two kind of quasi isolated uh, uh, parallel worlds to it. Right. Um, yeah, it's just kind of like, it's just like, uh, yeah, I, I think it's easiest to gesture at it with metaphors. You know, it's like, it's like the idea that the universe contains, you know, parallel universes that are disconnected in some ways and connected in other ways. Um, it's implausible, right? You know, uh, ha ha ha, good one, David. Um, uh, yeah, you know, so like, um, so that's the view and, and, uh, you know, if the examples don't move you in that direction, then they don't, right? You know, it's kind of like, I, you know, I, I should say as a general principle, I think that like um, theoretical as opposed to empirical reasoning in physics um, is something where I, I, I just feel like um, it's kind of, it's a bit like normative ethics. We're following norms. We have a really hard time writing down specifically what are the norms that we're following in detail? And if we do try to write that down, um, we're going to miss out on a bunch of truths about what those norms are. But, you know, like we can, we, we can get a good rough sense of the norms that we're following. And in particular, our judgments about, about cases can lead us in the direction of understanding when those norms are being violated, right? So that's why I'm trying to, to motivate the, the principle with analogies to other cases. That's what I would do if I was writing a paper in applied ethics, right? Uh, okay, uh, so um, I would like that we finish like in one minute. <laughs> so, Christian, if you could be very brief and uh, also the baker very brief, and then we finish. Uh, 
Okay, okay, perfect. Uh, many thanks for the for the talk, David. It was was really very interesting. I mean, I was wondering if you if you think of the symmetry to reality inference as a sufficient condition for really real properties, or only as a necessary condition. Because let me give you uh, an example that you already mentioned: uh, bono mechanics again. More metaphysically oriented Bohmians could say that, of course, there are many invariant properties of the theory that seem to refer to really real properties, but they actually do not. Really real properties are only position. The rest is just part of the representation, right? There are ways in which we can express, for example, how relative uh, distances vary from one time to time, and so on and so forth. But they are not real, real properties in the same sense. So it seems that this is a case in which the inference is only at best necessary, but it's not sufficient. You need to say something else about why we are allowed to promote um, I, I properties as really real properties. And I, I mean, and some women could, could run this story. So I just like to hear your thoughts about it. Yeah, I mean, my thoughts are that you nailed it. You're exactly right. It's it's a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition. Okay. I mean, indeed, it's not a strictly necessary condition because, as I was saying, it's a defeasible yeah. norm. You know, there there are there are going to be exceptions. We can we can at least come up with in principle. It's a pro tanto reason to interpret theories this way. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, we had uh, a very interesting discussion, but uh, we should move on with the. Uh, the program. So uh, thank you a lot for the talk and thanks to the respondent and the other uh, persons who are asking questions.